Hi, and welcome to the Hunger Trap Podcast. I'm Lisa. And I'm Diana. And we're here to talk to you about eating disorders, body dysmorphia, and the culture that sometimes promotes them. We are not healthcare providers or psychologists. We're just two women talking about our personal experiences with eating disorders to let others know they are not alone. And if you are currently seeking treatment for an eating disorder, just please be aware that we speak very candidly about weight, our bodies, and food, and you might find some of the content triggering. But if you're still with us, sit back and relax, and let's get to talking. Lisa and I started this podcast, one of the things that came up for us a lot was, you know, gosh, what would it be like to be young and have social media thrown on top of everything that we were struggling through in our young adult lives when it came to our eating disorders? Of course, social media sites like Instagram and TikTok and photo editing apps like Facetune. It seems like everybody these days is like their own personal art project. When you look at a picture of somebody, it's like, do they actually look like this or have they just been face-tuned and kardashian to within an inch of their life, you know? We're very much now using social media and these apps in control of how we want to look in an image and how we portray ourselves to the world. I mean, if you think about taking pictures when we were kids, everybody had those, you know, like click cameras or the disposable cameras and whatever photo you wound up with was the photo you wound up with from your get-together or your party and your eyes were half closed and your tongue was hanging, hanging out of your mouth and your hair was sticking up. And now we're very much in control of how we look in society and, and in images. But, you know, how in control are we really? You know, how has art, art from the past influenced the way we pose, which body parts we enhance, what we put on display, what we conceal, anything from skinny arm to duck face? You know, and we thought, why not talk about this sort of thing? You know, how does this relate to art history and actual art? Is social media art? <laughs> so yeah. we were like, well, we don't know. We're not art historians. But hey, guess what? We know art historians. <laughs> and so we decided to chat with them so they can give us some perspective on how women's bodies have been portrayed throughout art history and how these images have changed over time and how they influence the way women portray themselves now, today on their social media accounts. And so we're so excited to have two experts with us. First, I'm going to introduce Dr. Amber Ludwig, who is an art historian whose interests and specializations include portraiture, 18th century visual culture, and gender theory. Her dissertation, Becoming Emma Hamilton, Portraiture and Self-Fashioning in Late Enlightenment Europe, analyzes the various ways in which Lady Hamilton created a public identity to reflect the ideals of femininity at the turn of the 19th century. She teaches history and government in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Amber. Hello. Thank you, Diana and Lisa. We also have with us Dr. Heidi Strobel, who was a professor of art history, associate dean of the William L. Ridgway College of Arts and Sciences, and a curator of the Peters Margadant House at the University of Evansville. She received her BA in history from Kalamazoo College and her master's and PhD in art history from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her first two books have focused on amplifying the voices of the late 18th century European women artists and patrons. Her most recent book, a monograph and catalog of the work of textile artist Mary Linwood focuses on one of the many women working outside of mainstream artistic organizations. So welcome, Dr. Strobel. Thank you, Diana, and thank you to Lisa. <laughs> so we, um, we're so excited to talk to you, especially like with the fact that museums and galleries are it's limited in how much we can go see these days. So Diana and I set up this podcast, this Instagram podcast. One person that we follow is a fighter and a model and author. Her name is Mia Kang, and she also suffered from an eating disorder for years. And she has this memoir out called Knockout, where she talks about her eating disorder. And she hmm. posted this photo of herself where she was kind of hunched over and she had, you know, her flesh was in rolls. And it just wasn't a typical pose that you would see a woman pose in these days. And she gave a credit to a photographer named Alexandra Lees. Her Instagram handle, because it's great Instagram if you want to go check it out, is at Alex Lees, A-L-E-X-L-E-E-S-E. -E -E -E. And so Alex just recently published a book of photos called Me Plus Mine, and she just captures nude photos of women from all over the world on their webcams from their homes in a state where they are the most comfortable in their bodies. You see women with their shoulders hunched up, and they're slouching over and they have stomach rolls and there's flesh under their armpits and the pubic hair and absolutely nothing is photoshopped out as far as 
you can see. It's just beautiful. It's like they're not trying to be seductive. They're not trying to appeal to anybody else. They just look like so comfortable. We just really kind of want to start by asking one of you guys to take us back to the moment that we know of when the woman was defined by the male gaze in art and what was going on at the time and how was she portrayed? The Venus of Willendorf is what popped into my mind. And this is an ancient sculpture. It's a small sculpture. It appears in some pop culture references too. I think it's in like Hellboy 2 in the opening scenes of that movie in a much larger scale. But it's a very small fit in the palm of your hand sculpture of an image of a woman. She's very round. It's very bulbous. Art historians and archaeologists don't really know what it was meant for. Scholars generally think it was a fertility figure. It certainly must have held some special place as an object. So There's assumed to be some sort of ritual aspect to that. If this was a patriarchal society, certainly the male gaze or the male presence would have been part of its making. But it is a very round form. The arms are round, the belly's round, the face is round. She's wearing maybe a woven hat or a tight-knit cap. There's no eyes to be seen. So when you mention sort of when this all kind of started, the female form, that's the thing that pops into to my mind, is the Venus of Willendorf. How did that define what men at the time valued about women? I think that one thing would be, you know, the their ability to create and nurture a child because those parts of the body are really emphasized with the woman of, of Willendorf. And there are several, I mean, she's not the only fertility, well, it, this was likely a fertility kind of talisman, um, as Amber said, It's tiny, it fits in the palm of your hand, which tells us that it was probably something that people carried with them or, you know, that it was um, easily portable. And there are other figures who, um, there are other figures produced um, a little earlier uh, found in Germany that emphasize the same parts of the body. So it's basically the the breasts. You can barely tell that the woman of Willendorf actually has hands because they are encircling her really large breasts. Then her belly is rounded and her buttocks are rounded and she has nice big thighs. And so she, these are the parts of the body that, um, you know, uh, especially the breasts and the belly that would nurture, be home to children. And of course, with the high rate of death in childbirth, this was the type of body style that we can assume many men at least wanted in terms of creating a family that would live on and also workers to help sustaining the family. And like what, what century, what time period are you talking about specifically? 24,000 BCE. So very, very long time ago. So that's yeah. when I was supposed to be born. Okay, good. I'm glad I know. Because <laughs> that sounds exactly like my body. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's really, you know, when I teach about this, it's it's fascinating because I say, look, for anybody who doesn't feel good about their body right now, just think about how the ideal body style has changed. If we think about these figurines from so long ago, this was the type of body style that was that was favored, not this plucked, preened, curated, whatever other adjective you want to use to describe what is a body ideal today. So that's that's an interesting comment that kind of leads us into our next question. This societal ideal, does art define the societal ideal or does it reflect the societal ideal? It depends, I guess, on which country, which century. I think that it sustains a cultural ideal. Sometimes it does create it, sometimes it reflects it, but it certainly, I think, will give an ideal depth, if that makes sense. When Emma Hamilton starts to be made fun of for her body size, I started watching Bridgerton and I was looking at the body types and that and there's a a plump woman, a young woman in there and she's being made fun of by her sisters for being two stone heavier than she should be. So I was thinking about Amber's comment about when it's not cool anymore to be rounded. I wonder if, in fact, at least in Europe and in England and France where Amber and I think are most comfortable and Italy too, that that body style, that that skinniness becomes more of an ideal, um, something favorable in the early 19th century. I can't help but think about talking about the question. It's kind of like a which came first, chicken or the egg? Like, is it 
Is it art that's influencing people or is it the people that are influencing the art? And I think it's a much more intertwined relationship. And being a specialist of portraiture in the 18th century, I think that the the act of sitting for a portrait is an apt sort of uh, example of how this works. I think portraitists are an interesting type of artist in that they are creating a commodity that has to please almost immediately, or even while it's in process, a particular audience, the person that it is depicting. So you have the, the, the portraitist is under uh, pressure to create a good likeness. And there's in, in the writings of the times, from the novels to letters, there are people that talk about the likeness that is created by an artist. It has to be a good likeness. It has to look like the person, but maybe just a slightly better version of the person that's being depicted. And when we think about something like Instagram or TikTok or what you pick for your Facebook profile picture, your LinkedIn profile picture, I think that's a similar thing. It has to look like you, but you're probably editing it, massaging it to be a slightly better picture of you. And I don't think that that's anything new. Hmm. So I think the assumption for probably a lot of people is that the body type of the female form was mostly rounder for many, 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 many centuries until all of a sudden, maybe when the early 19th century, or I'm not sure when you guys can fill in the blanks here, until it suddenly shifted. Is that true, or was there actually more of a difference in female body types than we even realized throughout earlier centuries? I think that we're when we're talking about portraiture, it would you know we're already kind of taking a certain slice of the population um, that can afford to have their portraits painted, and so that's that's going to kind of circumscribe our data sample to use terms that I don't use very often. Um, so, you know, I think it again depends on the country, but yeah, I mean, portraits are reflecting and, and portraits like the ones that Amber and I work with are reflecting a very refined upper class segment of the um, English royal family and aristocracy. Then with the advent of the industrial revolution, I think there's kind of a a change that happens, Um, particularly in France in the early to mid 19th century, you have people engaging in sort of exercise for the purpose of movement. And I think that that sort of thing changes the way we perceive what a body should look like. And I think it kind of really comes to a head in the 20th century. In the mid 18th century, the mid to late 18th century, that wasn't necessarily a thing, you know, thinking about sculpting your body through movement was not something that people did. You would sculpt it through underwear and undergarments. You would use that to enhance the certain parts that were important. And then it could be further enhanced through the artistry of a, of a portrait painter. But I, I, think, I think something switches there in the modern period where people start doing activity for the sake of activity to build on what Amber just said, the Empress Elizabeth of Austria, better known as Sissi, S-I-S-I, she was very dedicated to maintaining a very small waist through exercise. And this would have been, I'm looking right now, yeah, so 1837 was the year that she was born, but she was married at the age of 17 to the Emperor of Austria. You know, the the Habsburg family of Austria was known for their huge families, big families, lots of kids. And Sissy was not into this. She wanted, you know, she did have a total of four children, but she very much um, maintained a rigorous exercise regimen. And we might, I think we would probably, if we were doing some armchair psychology, we'd probably say that she had a problem with excessive exercise, that she that was at least one part of her disorder, and probably anorexia as well. The reason why I bring her up is because she's fascinating. And there are a couple, there are three movies that are about her. And there's a, a couple books about her. But she was considered to be quite s- strange, unusual in the 1860s and 1870s for her dedication to thinness in this particular social class like not that thinness thinness was prized by the social class but the idea that you would maintain it by regular exercise was very strange indeed that was not 
really done to the extent that she did it. So um, it's Empress Elizabeth of Austria with an S um, instead of a Z. And she had this kind of tragic life because she was her son eventually killed himself. So there's probably some mental illness in the family that she suffered from as well. And she herself was assassinated in, you know, when she was in her early 50s. Did she appear in many artworks? I'm just wondering if she was she like... Does. She, she does. she like the Kim Actually. Kardashian of her time where like the wealthy class saw this new body type and kind of took their cues from her? Here's the thing that I find fascinating. She had a lot of... She exercised a lot of control over her own images. There's one portrait of her with her son and her husband... But for the rest of the pictures are pretty much of only her. And she was very conscious to not sit for her portrait very often. So, or by, with her, members of her family. So she wanted to be, I wonder if she was, I wonder if she was the Kim Kardashian. Because she very much, at least in the portraits by Winterhalter, pretty famous artist, friends, uh, Xavier Winterhalter. She very much wants to be seen and, I guess, appreciated for her singular beauty as opposed to her role in a larger family structure. Now you have me thinking about Emma Hamilton. And I'd love, Amber, if you could talk a little bit about her. I mean, she was new to me and she's fascinating. Did wealthier women have more control over their images than a woman like Emma Hamilton, who really was defined by the male gaze? Emma Hamilton was is probably best known as the lover of Admiral Horatio Nelson, who defeated Napoleon at the Battle of Trafalgar. Emma Hamilton was married to William Hamilton, who was a diplomat stationed in Naples during the French Revolution. She was born quite poor. She worked for um, some actresses in London, like caring for their costumes. She was a maid to a doctor in London as well. She pregnant with the illegitimate child of a wealthy London sort of playboy. She went to another man and said, I'm pregnant with so-and-so's baby and what are we gonna do? And this other man helps her and it turns out he's the nephew of Sir William Hamilton. Anyway, she kind of gets passed around all of these men. They introduce her as sort of connoisseurs of the age to uh, George Romney, who's a famous British portrait painter at the time. Romney paints her. She moves to Naples, marries William Hamilton. All of the artists start hearing about how beautiful she is, what a good model she is. They all want to paint her. Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun, who's a famous French female artist, uh, leaves Paris in the Revolution but goes to Naples and paints Emma Hamilton right after, I believe, she paints Catherine the Great in Russia. <laughs> so, you know, she's being painted by these very famous artists. I think in my, in my work, I argue that very early on, she realizes her, the power that she has with her physical presence. She utilizes her ability to model and to be beautiful as a way to climb the social ladder, but also to craft this identity that's very acceptable. She's beautiful, but she's oftentimes, as was the fashion, is depicted in a very antique way that elevates her, the ideal woman. She's not just this sort of base, ordinary, everyday beautiful woman. She has this sense of like timeless beauty to her. She really uses this to her great benefit and becomes ultimately one of the great, I guess, destinations on the grand tour for usually a traveling Englishman when they reached a certain age would travel throughout Europe. And it was one of the things to do was to go see Emma Hamilton perform these attitudes, which were kind of like dances and poses that she would perform by candlelight. And then they made prints after them. They were so famous. People wanted prints of them to take back to their English country houses. She was celebrated in this way for her beauty. And then the affair with Nelson starts. It doesn't really jive with this heroic idea of a national hero. And Emma and Nelson and Hamilton all start to be lampooned in the press, particularly in caricatures. And Emma, at the end of her life, gains a lot of weight. In all of these cartoons, she is depicted as this much larger, sort of influential figure who uh, has made these two very famous wealthy men cuckolds, and they're always depicted as kind of smaller and slighter. So you have this juxtaposition of this like influential woman as a very large presence, and then these so-called influential men being sort of 
turned over by this woman. And I think these depictions of size really speak to the way women were viewed and what was expected of them in Mm. the late 18th, early 19th centuries. That's so interesting. I mean, like immediately I just start thinking of the fact like, do we ever really know what anybody actually really looks like if their image was curated as you spoke and then also if they're being mocked or exaggerated in the press do we ever get to see reality in art and i think that that is not just an 18th to 19th century thing i think it's the same thing happening now in the 21st century what what is the reality what are you noticing that female or non-gendered artists are doing differently when they portray the female form. This is really kind of surprising me because I assumed all along that the male artists had a real hand in shaping what the female ideal body was. And just hearing some examples about how these aristocratic women really shaped their own image, it's really interesting to me how much more power women kind of had over their images. So for me, modern modern means 18th century and early 19th century for me, because, well, a couple of reasons, that's my area of expertise, but it's also, I think, where so many things begin that we are still observing today, like body standards, curating one's you know presentation, those kind of things. I'm not sure that I'm going to answer the question completely, but what I would say is, even among women, how they portray themselves, other women, there's such a big variety if we're talking about somebody like Vijay Lebrun, Vijay Lebrun and very few other female artists like Angelica Kaufman and Mary Moser in England, they had a pretty comprehensive classical education, even though they weren't able to sketch nude bodies, because to figure out how to depict the human body, you had to take a life study class. And only the artist who could go to like Royal Academies and things like that could attend these classes. But if you were a woman, you couldn't attend the classes. So we're talking about the select group of women who were admitted to these Royal Academy schools and then became members who were able to kind of cobble together by by looking at some cast, by looking at their own body, how to depict the female form. Then you have other women, women with whom I have a fair amount of uh, contact or knowledge of who didn't have that ability at all because they were working outside of these institutions. And I will bring this a little bit more forward too to talk yeah. about women artists in the 20th and 21st centuries. When we started talking about doing this, I couldn't help but think about Jenny Savile, who is a British artist who specializes in painting women's bodies. And she, I remember the first one that I ever saw work by Jenny Savile, it, it, it's an, they're enormous. They often can fit on the side of a, of a building or can be 12 feet tall. And it was the image of the back of a woman. And the whole back, you couldn't really tell, it, it filled the whole plane of the, of the canvas. And then at the very top, maybe the top 10%, you saw shoulders and a little head peeking over the shoulders. And then you realize what looks like a abstract painting was modeled skin, very soft, fleshy modeled skin, blues and pinks and yellows. And she really does, I think, just a brilliantly moving job of showing a more diverse way of looking at the body, but from a very painterly perspective. You acknowledge that you're seeing a representation of a body, but it's hard to separate it from the beauty of the paint that you're seeing on the canvas. And it's not just sort of, you know, small waist, rounded hips, you know, perky boobs. It's not not that type of female body. It's much more sort of what many women might see when they take a shower or look at themselves in the mirror. Can you repeat the artist's name? Yeah, Jenny Savile, S-A- V-I-L-L-E. She's a British artist, and there's a group of kind of a loose group called Young British Artists, and a lot of them are women, and they really do, all of them, kind of push the boundaries of representation, I think, in a really cool way. But one of the ways that, that she does it is through images of the body. Listening to you, Amber, talk about Emma Hamilton and how she was this, like, lauded, celebrated beacon of beauty that was then mocked later on it just it strikes me that you know women our our looks have been currency that does not retain its value over time and that women who really rely on their looks as currency at the end of the day get mocked and shamed for not keeping up 
the ideal that they were celebrated for. Like, even if you just think about modern times, when you see beautiful actresses of our time that were, you know, held up as like the standard of beauty who then go and have plastic surgery and maybe the surgery is a little obvious. And so they go from being celebrated to ridiculed in our, in the media. It just kind of like, like that's been going on. It sounds like forever. Yeah. I think she realizes that the sort of clock has run out on the beauty and at the end of her life when she's wanting a little more privacy in order to maintain and grow her relationship with Nelson she turns away from portraiture and moves towards what I argue my dissertation is a architectural representation she buys an estate a really rundown farm just outside of London with Nelson's money not with her own money and decorates it and renovates it and sets it up as this private estate. She has had Nelson's baby by this point and sort of sets up this rural utopian estate where she had hopefully planned to live out the rest of her days in sort of privacy with Nelson. And I think it's interesting that she realizes that maybe the time has run out on the beauty and she looks to some other way to fashion this identity that still falls in line with what a quote unquote good woman is. This also has me thinking about how abstract art feels like freedom compared to portraiture and traditional paintings in a way like when you see a Picasso figure of a female body, it it just feels freeing to know that it doesn't represent any kind of specific body ideal. Oh, Picasso's a big problem, though. Oh, no. About about women's bodies. Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Isn't he like a total misogynist? (laughs) Yeah. We'll save it for another time. But I do agree with you that being freed from a sort of representation of rules, whether it's sort of classical antiquity or this is what an idealized human form looks like. I mean, that is that is a, a freeing thing. And I think someone like Jenny Saville does a good job of that, of kind of freeing what a body, quote unquote, should look like. This has been fascinating. Thank you so, so much for joining us. For anyone who would like to reach out to Dr. Ludwig or Dr. Schrobel directly with any questions or comments, Amber can be reached at Amber Ludwig Otero, A-M-B-E-R-L-U-D-W-I-G-O-T-E-R-O at gmail.com. And Heidi may be reached at hs40 at evansville.edu. And we have an Instagram and Facebook. So our Instagram is hunger underscore trap underscore podcast. And our Facebook is The Hunger Trap Podcast. You could also reach us by email at thehungertrappodcast at gmail.com. And once again, Dr. Ludwig, Dr. Strobel, thank you so much for joining us. And everybody, good luck with your journeys. Bye.